So for those of you um, who maybe be joining us, maybe are joining us for the first time here. My name is Alex Bynaman and I am the Director of Program and Staff Development for Cambridge Children's Mental Health. I'm a licensed master social worker and I'm joined today by um, Dr. Abby and she is our VP of Clinical Engagement and Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Belonging. So thank you, Dr. Abby, for being here with us today. And we are gonna go ahead and look at this poll that we have been all answering. So let's see if we can. Oh, that is not what I wanted that to do. I'm having some trouble looking at the results of that poll. Got a couple people on today to help me out. So I might see. Here we go. Um, Sorry, One guys. Sec. Thanks. See the question, but not the poll responses. Okay. Let's see what our question is here. I'm not seeing any questions. Abby, are you able to see the poll responses? I can see the poll question, but not the poll responses. And I really was curious. I wanted to see those. Let's see. Brittany, is there something? Yeah, I'm working on it. One second. Oh, Sorry. No worries. Um, so the poll question was, what do you guys enjoy most about your community? So Abby, you and I can go ahead and start talking about what we enjoy about our communities. And then hopefully Brittany will be able to get us those answers. And we can review those as a group if you want to go ahead and take it away. Yeah, definitely. I'm Abby Washington Tabron. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Engagement and Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. So excited to be with you guys today. And since we're talking about community violence, like it occurred to us, like we all live in communities. That's why we were really like anxious to hear about like what about your community? Do you get really amped about? Do you get really excited about? My favorite part of my community is that I love the walkability. I love that I can walk to my favorite restaurants or um, bars or <laughs> recreational spaces and stores and whatnot. I love that. What about you, Alex? Yeah, walkability is huge. Um, I also live in a decently walkable area and I love that about my community as well. But I happen to live in an area that is very um, diverse and there's so many like authentic food restaurants around me on every corner, all mm -hmm. different kinds. And so I love that anytime that we are looking to eat something different or maybe something we haven't tried before, we don't have to go far and we just get to kind of meet and be a part of these different little pockets in our community. And it definitely makes our community a lot of fun and a lot of um, very engaging. Yeah, that's what makes it worth it. Absolutely. And it's still just showing you that people answered not the content of the poll. No, yeah. oh, hopefully they can see. Um, I can see a view detail. Oh, I can see some of them. Is my, is ever, are people... What are you still looking at, Dr. Abby? Are you still seeing our PowerPoint slide? No, I see um, just a blue screen. A blue screen. Okay. I'm able to see some of the answers, but it does affect the view of everybody else. But yeah. I can share some of those with you guys real quick. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, so some of the different things that were shared today that people appreciate about their communities are kind of that small town feel, that people look out for one another, that, they, that their community has a lot of resources for those in need. Um, someone from Raytown, wait, someone from Raytown mentioned the camaraderie of the community. Uh, another person talked about how the community comes together during critical events, which is something we're going to talk about later when we talk about resiliency. It's absolutely vital for our communities. Other things that we're seeing here are different celebrations throughout the year and a supportive community that is um, very engaged with one another. We're seeing diversity as some of people's favorite things. We're seeing that mentioned quite a bit. The school communities are being mentioned, parks, zoos, museums, a lot of outdoor recreational activities. Uh, community is walkable. So those are some of the things that people are making people feel connected to their communities and really loving their communities. Any of those stand out to you, Dr. Abby, or that you want yeah, to I mean, on? you can tell how much that like weighs into your quality of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
feel like it, it prevents us from being so isolated when we understand like how to engage with our communities and we're able to do that easily and it's quite accessible to be a part of your community. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, thank you all for contributing to that poll. We're going to maybe have a few moments throughout this webinar today where we kind of ask for your opinion or we have like different inflection points that we might want you to reflect on or a poll to get involved on. Um, so, but first let's jump in. Um, let's um, do some framing or grounding to connecting why we're all here today. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control has actually warned that community violence is a critical public health problem in the United States. I personally think it's no coincidence that the US Surgeon General also recently released a report calling stern attention to what they've termed an epidemic of loneliness and social isolation in our country. This definitely got us thinking when we were sort of planning around this um, webinar for Camber. What do we need to learn about the relationship between healthy connections and safer communities? Most of us here work in roles that influence the lives of young people. We, in fact, are part of the larger network of resources and supports that make up their communities. So it's on all of us in this webinar today. We all have a collective interest and investment in understanding the factors in their lives that pose a threat to their safety and well being. In thinking about the larger public health outcomes for children, how, so, how safe children tend to feel and the quality of their mental health has not always been included in that equation. Understanding and really appreciating the mental and the physical effects of community violence on children is more important than ever. For many children, the stress of complex trauma or the layering of community violence on top of already targeted violence against women and girls, discrimination and marginalization, systemic racism, homophobia, et cetera, only strains their internal resources and capacities even more. Thankfully, we're coming into greater focus in our awareness of holistic health outcomes in childhood and adolescence and insisting that mental health and safety are inclusive of that understanding. Anywhere children can experience violence, they can also experience opportunities to build resilience, strength, and to get support. Alex, I know we wanted to, just in reflection of lives lost and communities uprooted and challenged and changed, we wanted to like give 30 minutes of silence and solidarity and acknowledgement for the lives lost, shortened or impacted. Yeah, I think we're going to do that 30 seconds of silence just because we understand that while this is a topic that everyone here is here to discuss and learn how to um, prevent and respond to. It's also something that as individual members of all different kinds of communities, we are, we are affected by as well. And so we're gonna take that 30 seconds now. So if everyone can just take some time to reflect and appreciate those who've been affected and we'll get started again in just a moment. So Dr. Abby touched on kind of the big important pieces of why we're here and why this conversation matters. But in addition to that, we do have objectives and things that we really hope you take away from this training. So our goal is that after participating in this session, as attendees, you guys will be able to identify the community-based based violence that those most experienced by youth. Um, and some of that is a little bit under-recognized or has some numbers that I think might be surprising to some people. 
We also want to make sure that we've done um, our due diligence in helping participants understand areas of need for increased attention due to additional risk factors for experiencing violence. And that one's going to be one where we really talk about the language that we use around that and the mindset. Cultural competency is going to play a big part in that objective as well. And then lastly, that you feel like you can apply prevention and intervention approaches to increase resiliency and positive coping in our youth. We understand that this is kind of a multiple faceted solution to a really big problem. And so we want to equip our youth with the skills that they need to handle what's going on in our communities while simultaneously working within our communities to reduce those instances. Great. I don't know about you guys, but when I see headlines of a mass shooting incident or some other horror across our country, my first knee jerk thought that comes to my mind is like, where? Like where not because anywhere is ever acceptable for a tragedy, but where more because more and more it's feeling like community violence is hitting closer to home. And my worries are not altogether misplaced. Statistically, we know that children and teens from all zip codes, demographics, economic class, are at risk for indirect and direct exposure to community violence. Most of the attention from the media and our wider culture tends to depict community violence as something that only or primarily happens in communities where resources and opportunities are more deprived. But the National Center for PTSD reports that community violence occurs in white middle-class areas, both urban and suburban. Children and teens from all zip codes and demographics are at risk for community violence and deserve our protection. The National Center for PTSD also reports that over one third of children across the country, ages 10 to 16, that's pretty young, have faced indirect community violence, meaning that they have directly witnessed violence or that they know a direct victim of community violence. In one interesting study where over three quarters of the children living in an urban area reported experiencing community violence, more than half of their parents reported that their children had not been exposed to community violence. This finding basically means that parents, teachers, and other important adults in a young person's life may or may not always know if or when their children have been exposed to violence. What is perhaps one of the worst consequences of community violence that rarely gets attention is that even concerns about violence happening in your community can prevent young people and their families from fully engaging in healthy behaviors, such as walking, going to the pools, cycling, using the parks, um, at the playgrounds and other recreational facilities in our areas, going out to eat, attending worship or spiritual services. Um, as, as we all heard from each other, all of those activities are really an important component, not only into our community life, but into our personal lives as well. So this fear can ultimately threaten business growth. It strains education and healthcare resources and systems and generally stifles the prosperity and livelihood of a community. Wow, that's really interesting, Dr. Abby. I think it's it's really hits home with me like how much adults don't always understand what the kids are going through or what they're experiencing. And really just, we're gonna talk a lot about building relationships with kids and how that is so key to resilience. And hopefully that would also allow us to have a little bit better insight into what their day-to-day -day experiences are like. Yeah, yeah. So we're not going to go too far deep down um, a gun control conversation or policy conversation, but like we just wanted to kind of maybe talk a little bit about a case study that's a little closer to home. Um, so that's the Canadian flag, as we all know. Um, and the numbers that we just talked about are so unacceptable because each one of those represents a life that's precious and meaningful to a family or community. Um, so it got us thinking, are there places, where are these places where this experience of risk and harm to children may not be so prevalent? And is there something unique about the United States policy and history and culture that are kind of contributing to this kind of rising tension and violence? 
According to a new study, looking at the 35 best and most challenging or difficult countries to raise a family, the United States placed a shocking 34th out of 35 countries. Topping the list were Iceland, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. So this study looked at 30 critical statistics from trusted international sources and broke those down into six categories to help identify favorable conditions for raising families, such as safety, happiness, cost, uh, health, education, and the time it takes. This study found that safety severely impacted the United States' ranking. The US also scored poorly in the human rights category with systemic racism being just one example of this exposure. So Canada, our neighbor to the north and my first home, shares the world's longest undefended border with the United States. I actually didn't know that. Um, so if we live so close to our neighbors in the north and we share similar Western values, why is there such a stark difference in safety and well-being just miles away? Well, Canada has differed from the US in that there are no constitutional rights to bear arms, which Canadians have long defended as a core value issue for them. But in the 10 years between 2006 and 2016, Canadians saw an erosion of gun control laws. Since that time, Canada now has the third highest rate of firearm homicide among populous high-income countries just after the United States and Chile. In the past decade alone, Canada has experienced 15 mass shootings. Now, while gun control policies and laws are not the only contributing factor to gun violence in our communities, violent firearm crimes has surged since Canada has relaxed their gun control laws. That is just in their data. This relationship between gun control laws and the rates of violent crimes and involving firearms has been fairly well documented in the profiles of countries that, that kind of share the same issue. So in response to this increase in gun violence, the Canadian government has responded with legislative changes and a community focused approach to address the social determinants of gun violence, which I thought was really like unique and hadn't heard that before. Um, so in no November, 2022, so that's not even a year ago now, Canada's federal government introduced amendments to draft gun control legislation that would permanently ban military style assault weapons. Um, in pockets of America, we're trying to do the same thing, or at least we've heard that call. Canada asserted that these changes were necessary and were supported by public health science, and they are. The assault weapons ban that the Canadian government has proposed would bring the country into closer alignment with peer nations like Australia, New Zealand, Norway, and Japan, where assault weapon bans have led to a reduction in the amount of mass shootings and in some instances, a reduction in firearm suicides and homicides. So scientific evidence and public health consensus supports that gun com comprehensive gun control laws are effective in saving lives. Thanks, Dr. Abby, for sharing that. I, I think it's one of those things that when we first hear, it's kind of like an, oh, duh, or yeah, like we've heard that data before, but just hearing how just very small tweaks to different things can have such a large impact, I think can be really hopeful for some of the things that we're seeing in the U.S. and some of the things that we're facing in our own communities. Yeah, they can really help reshape the way that safety looks and feels um, across a whole country. Absolutely. And I think it really speaks to that concept of also, like you said, how safety feels, like that idea of psychological safety. So it's not just about actually reducing those events, but also just how we feel in our communities, because that is just as negatively, or probably maybe not quite as negatively, but it's also negatively impactful to our health and our engagement in our community and the way that we um, interact with others around us. For sure. So when we talk about community violence, what exactly does that mean? And so if you 
look at the National Tra Child Traumatic Stress Network. They're going to be talking and defining community violence as exposure to intentional acts of, in of interpersonal violence committed in public areas by individuals who are not intimately related to the victim. So these are going to be things like assaults or fights that are witnessed or experienced by community members, homicides pop into this category, shootings in public places or attacks with other weapons. And we're also going to see sexual violence fall into that community violence definition. And the physical and emotional and financial pain from this violence passes through individuals to their families, to the communities. And it's really just like all around harming and, and more than just the one to two to however many people were involved in the exact incident. And so the effect of that stretches so much further to everyone else in the community. Um, youth ages, youth and young adults ages 10 to 34 are, especially those in community of color are at an even higher, um, they're disproportionately impacted. They're experiencing these things even more so than other areas. Um, however, we do know that violence is perpetuated in all communities. So some of the common experiences that children are having in America right now, um, this data is based off of surveys done through youth, the youth.government website, which is a government website where they collect data based on youth experiences, as well as the CDC youth risk behavior surveillance system data that's collected. And what we're seeing is that 19.9% of high school students have reported witnessing community violence. So about 20% of all high school students in America have said that they've witnessed at least one event of community violence. We're seeing homicide is the third leading cause of death, ages 10 to 24. Um, 12 is the number of 10 to 20 year old victims of homicide per day. So we're having 12 children die of homicide per day here in the US. And in addition to that, about 1400 are treated daily for non-fatal assault related injuries. So these numbers are pretty large and, and we're really seeing that um, affect our youth. And it's definitely not something that just a small pocket of our community is experiencing. In addition to that, we're also seeing one in five high schoolers report having been bullied the, like multiple days throughout their school year. So that's another level of violence that um, our children are experiencing. We are having a second webinar next week that's a little bit more focused on just school violence and the violence that's perpetuated within side schools. So we'll really expand on that statistic in that training. So this data here is taken from that youth risk behavior surveillance system. And so I have both Kansas and Missouri data here, as I know a lot of our participants are from those areas. And then we also have the United States as a whole. These numbers are inclusive of both middle schoolers and high schoolers. And if it says unavailable, it just means that the state did not offer that information to the CDC in this year. So the survey year is 2021. Um, and what we're seeing is that 3.5% of high school and middle school students across the United States have reported carrying a gun. Um, and that number jumps to 5.1% in Missouri. We aren't able to see that number for Kansas. We see that about 18.3% of high school and middle schoolers in the US have experienced one physical fight or more. In Kansas, that number is 15.9, so just under that United States number, and then it's about 16.0 in Missouri. So Kansas and Missouri are looking pretty similar with the number of kids who are experiencing that. The next thing they ask related to community violence is if children have ever seen someone physically attacked, beaten, stabbed, or shot in their neighborhood, and again, that 19.9% is what United States as a whole, the youth in the United States are experiencing. And then in Kansas is not disclosing that number to the survey in the year 2021, but Missouri is, and they're at about 19.6%. So they're falling pretty equal with the United States average of that number. And then when we look at forced to physically forced to have sexual intercourse, you're seeing those numbers um, a little bit higher in both Kansas and Missouri than they are nationally. So these are just some, some things to I think about, and I think we have another poll question I'm going to go ahead and get going for you guys. So if you guys will go ahead and let us know what you're thinking about like this information, what's standing out to you. I know that we know that our kids are experiencing a lot of violence, but seeing some of these numbers is anything um, kind of shocking or does it surprise you in any way? And we'll let that go for about 30 seconds to 45 seconds here.
getting those answers rolling in. Okay, we're still having a lot of people answer. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll so we can talk about some of these results. So I think it's gonna show just a blank blue screen again while I look at these and I apologize for that, but I do wanna be able to share some of them. Um, someone shared that they knew about teen violence, but they were shocked to see kids as young as 10 experiencing that. And we are seeing that in the data quite frequently. And um, kind of being surprised that Kansas is higher than the national average for forced sexual intercourse. That also shocked me when I was putting this presentation together. I did not expect that number to be that high. Overall, just that these numbers um, are horrifying, especially related to sexual violence. The staggering number of 20% essentially who've never, who have ever seen someone be attacked in the US. So overall, I think that we, we hear often and we know that these community violence events are happening and that children are witnessing them. But I think when we see it in numbers like this, it really hits home with how many youth in our communities are impacted. And it really kind of gets us going to see, okay, now we have these measurable numbers, let's do some preventative and some responsive interventions and see if we can get these numbers down because our kiddos don't need to be having these experiences. Yeah, and if those numbers are surprising us who are kind of like immersed in the field and with, you know, young people who've experienced some difficult stuff, can you imagine how, you know, lay people, if you will, people in the community um, would, you know, be shocked to find out, you know, children that are in their homes or in next door or in their classrooms have been experiencing, you know, violence at that level. Absolutely. I think that that's a good point that we are kind of in this space to be more to more acutely in tuned to some of this. And so it could be much more shocking for those who are not kind of working within this world where this is a reality of things that we face every day. So with all of those experiences of community violence, of witnessing community violence, of, of being a victim of it or perpetrating it, we're seeing a pretty large impact on the mental health status of our youth in the U.S. And so this chart over here on the right side of the screen is from the CDC and it is those wire or that youth risk behavior surveillance system kind of ratings and you can see over the last multiple survey years I think there's six survey years here in total how those numbers have changed so we're seeing 42 percent of our high school students are saying that they have persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. And um, this question actually expands to say that it has affected them doing their normal day-to-day -day activities for up to, up to, or for over two weeks at a time. So 42% of high school students have experienced the persistent feeling of sadness or hopelessness to a point where they've not been able to engage in their normal day-to-day -day activities for a time period of two weeks or more. And that number is huge. Um, we have 29% that are reporting just poor mental health. That's a new question in the 2021 survey, so we're not seeing the data for that these year over year. For seriously considering attempted suicide, we're seeing 22%. That is an increase from 2019, which was at 19%, and it is one of the bigger increases we've seen across these numbers. Here we have 16, 17, 18, 17, 19. So they're really hanging in the same area, and then we see that huge 3% jump. And I know that 3% doesn't feel like that large of a number, but when you're talking about tens of thousands, I think it's something along maybe 27,000 participants um, of the survey, or maybe a few more than that. If when we're talking about numbers that big, a 3% increase is, is pretty large in those that have considered attempting suicide. We see a 2% jump in those that have made a plan to commit suicide and at 18% for high school students. And then we're seeing about 10% of students, high school students nationwide attempting suicide. Um, those who have been injured by a suicide attempt that had to be treated by a doctor or nurse is at 3%. So those numbers also kind of shed a light into what the children that we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis are kind of dealing with. Other key findings that we are able to look at through some other results are that approximately 50% of females and approximately 70% of LGBTQIA plus students experience persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. So 
with the average for all high schoolers being 42% for both of these populations, we're seeing that even higher. And that 10% of female and 20% of LGBTQIA plus students have attempted suicide. So we're seeing that attempt number look drastically different for the LGBTQIA population. So those are just some things to keep in mind as we talk about some of those factors that maybe help us know when to hold someone a little closer or where to focus our resources. Wow, thanks, Alec. Um, that's why conversations, engagement, connection with the young people in our orbit couldn't be um, more important. What happened to you? Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say there was a quick question here in yeah. the poll, you guys, or in the uh, chat. The question was: Does sexual violence refer to the abuse or assault only, or does it also encapsulate threats of sexual violence, implied or otherwise? So, such as catcalling, jokes about assault, lewd comments made to minors, etc. Yeah. So, with the youth behavior. Um, the youth risk behavior surveillance system, they're only asking about forced intercourse. And so there is, to your point, a, a large amount of other sexually violent things that can happen to our youth that we're not seeing that data on. So those numbers are specifically just for forced intercourse. It doesn't even include the cat calling, the name calling, the other kind of what people would consider lower level sexual violations, even though they're just as serious. So I would imagine those numbers to be much larger. I know that we just don't currently have the data on that. For sure. And then I will just say Rochelle DePriest also commented that those numbers triple when you survey students in our KCMO schools. Wow. Thank you for that information. That is fascinating. Triple. I'm going to make a note of that so I can look into that. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, hey, what happened to you versus what's wrong with you represents what you probably know by now is the central question core to the trauma-informed paradigm. This shift has compelled us all to look beyond the troublesome behaviors or symptoms that we may see in children and dig a little deeper into the why. Alex shared a range of psychological and suicide risk problems that children and teens experience. Um, that can overwhelm their coping strategies and negatively impact their development, their relationships, and their outlook on life. Um, we hope that you're going to join us for the second part of this webinar series. It's going to kind of really dig into um, addressing school, the violence in schools with, in greater focus. When is that, Alex? That's I want to be next, 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 week. next Thursday, the 5th. Great, great. Um, but so... Before that, I wanted to drop this kind of stat nugget on you. There has been an 88% increase in gun violence on our school grounds in the past 10 years, just in the past 10 years. So just let's think about that for a moment. An 88% increase in gun violence just in one decade. Um, that means that our schools have dramatically changed from the schools that you and I went to and probably even the schools that our older children may have gone to. Um, that means that schools, in addition to learning and providing social opportunities for growth, are now really having to focus a great deal of their attention on what it means to keep young people and the teachers in those schools safe. When children are exposed to this kind of violence at a young age, they are at an increased risk for experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder and substance abuse behaviors over the course of their lifetime. Children may develop new problems as a result of their exposure to trauma that affect them at home, at school, with their peers, with other adults, and with their own internal sense of safety and identity. It may surprise you to hear me say this, but not all stress is a bad thing. There are some times when stress can be helpful. Like for example, preparing to present a webinar for hundreds of people, some stress can be helpful in prepare, preparing to perform for something that's really important. But when that stress doesn't stop at 1.31 p.m. when the webinar is over, if it continues for hours or days or weeks afterwards, well, that stress becomes a real problem. The adaptive functions that occur when a body is responding to in-the-moment stress, like our muscles tensing up, 
changes in our breathing rate, our increase in heart rate, activation of our stress hormones. Those are all pretty important when I need to slam on my brakes to avoid an accident. Human survival depends on the activation of the fight and flight response in response to potential threats even. Yet for some children, heightened exposure to community violence creates a constant state of fear, activating the stress response apparatus in the central nervous system, even when kids may not need it. For children who are exposed to intermittent or chronic violence, they can become, as some research described, like incubated in terror. The neurobiological adaptations that allow children to survive violent threat can ultimately lead to violence and mental health problems even when they are no longer adaptive. The neurodevelopmental blueprint linked to early violence exposure can even translate into a distorted worldview so that for some children, it can lead to hypervigilance, to threat, misattribution of intent. I didn't mean that. Is that what he's trying to threaten me with? And a willingness to endorse violence or just resort to violence. These patterns of distortions in thinking and relating can become increasingly entrenched over time and can lead to problematic patterns of perception and action aligned with aggressive and violent behavior. In essence, these internalized schemas about the need for or the appropriateness of aggression serve as mechanisms through which community violence continues to further a lead to aggression and violence. Now, if you have children in your life, I have children in my life that we care deeply about, you know firsthand that what happens to a child in your life also happens to you. A child's exposure to community violence directly impacts their families, their friends, and their larger community, community as well, because it's very troubling for a parent or for another adult in the community to reconcile that they may not have been able to protect a child that they love or care about. The constant worry and stress that a parent may harbor over their child's safety and well-being can put a tremendous strain on their parenting, which in turn can show up in parenting approaches that may be overly anxious or overly protective. Yeah, I think that some of what you, I mean, when you talk about the way that it affects adults that are in children's lives, it is really impactful. I think that we all, most people wear many hats. We can be care providers, we're parents, we're aunts, we're uncles, we're um, like our, our friends have kids that we identify with. And so I think that even when we have this knowledge, when we have this expertise, that feeling of when a child that you care about is affected by something, mm -hmm. it can be really paralyzing. You might say, Hey, like I know from my professional career that these are all of the right responses, but when it's happening to you or happening to the child that you love, that can be a really hard thing to kind of separate and identify with. And I think that that is, Part of what makes some of this stuff so hard right now is while we are providers in the community trying to work with these kids, it's also happening to the kids that we care about. And it's, it feels like we can make less of an impact there sometimes, if that makes sense. It does. It does. For those of you that appreciate some good brain science, um, and I do, because to tell you the truth, when you're working with kids, and I've been working with young people for a long time who've gone through the worst of the worst of the worst, um, and to try to really assess what's going on with them has been challenged. And brain science has really opened up, almost opened up the doors to a much clearer understanding of what happens when we are traumatized. Um, this brain imaging and science has given us invaluable tools to understand human development across the lifespan. In fact, it's not just childhood. We now know that there are at least two distinct surges of brain development in childhood, early childhood and adolescence. In the absence of these important findings, the emotional lives of babies and young children had been sort of a mystery. It might be easy to think that because a child is so young, they don't experience the same type of mental health effects that we do because they can't verbalize it. They can't say how they're in distress or that they are in distress 
or we might even feel like they're too young to remember anything. But studies have shown that even young children can exhibit signs and symptoms of PTSD following exposure to violent events in their lives. For very young children, repeated exposure to community violence can contribute to problems forming positive and trusting relationships necessary for children to explore their environment securely and develop a secure sense of self. Difficulties forming these attachment relationships can interfere with the development of a basic sense of trust and compromise future relationships well into adulthood. Of particular concern is the effect that these experiences have on the child's developing brain, and we know more about that now. Similarly, the past few decades have been especially illuminating in our understanding of the period of development that we now call early adolescence and early adulthood. Adolescents have a little bit of a marketing problem though. Oftentimes they're like moodiness, their attitude, their behavior choices end up being their lead story. But we now know that there's scientific reasons why adolescents may be more prone to responding in ways that rely more heavily on reacting emotionally. The development of their prefrontal cortex is busy at work and it's that part of the brain that's responsible for organizing and planning, focusing their attention, thinking critically, controlling their impulses, and regulating emotions. So as adults, we often say, what were you thinking, dude? What were you thinking? Because we expect adolescents to apply reason and logic to the way that they see and respond to things, which may, may be a little bit misguided by us, but now we have the brain science. Um, for them, it takes real life experiences to build their prefrontal cortexes. We can't lecture them into building that part of their brain. The adolescent brain grows by doing things. So it's got to be able to make decisions that affect their lives and then learn from those decisions. During adolescence, our brains are actually like sponges. It's very exciting. And this stage of being a sponge is called neuroplasticity, meaning it's the brain's, the brain's way of taking shape or building architecture in response to the experiences that young people have and the environments that they're in. That's why we say every interaction in a young person's life is an intervention because every interaction holds the potential of having a really big impact on the way their brains develop. For both young children and for adolescents, trauma is not only emotional. It actually changes the way young brains development develop. Fortunately, because of neuroplasticity, um, there are so many ways that we can heal, we can retrain and essentially rewire the brain from traumatic experiences. We're going to get into some of those different skill building activities you can do to kind of work with that neuroplasticity and hopefully kind of retrain and rewire some of those maybe um, misinformed or uh, not correctly developed. And they're easier than you think, we think. <laughs> they're much easier than you think. So now we're going to get into factors that complicate risk and vulnerability. And before we start talking about this slide, I want to preface it with, we were really intentional with choosing how we talked about this. We did not want this to feel like we were saying that these minority or marginalized groups are just at a higher risk because of X, Y, and Z, and therefore we should only ever be responding to that level of risk. We want to kind of reframe that from, while yes, there does need to be an increased response in certain areas, we also need to ensure that we are are, are being preventative in those spaces. And so we know that the experience of violence affects all people regardless of their identifiers or their location or their demographics. Um, but there are some characteristics that can help inform areas that we should prioritize when implementing preventative strategies or um, resilience building ideas or reduction plans. There are 
factors that can help us know when to maybe hold a youth a little closer or to spend a little more time or pay a little extra close attention. And then also where we need to maybe allocate resources first. As we continue to work through these preventative ideas and these reduction strategies, there's gonna to be tons of different resources that hopefully develop and we have to have a way to organize how we roll them out and where our target areas need to be. Children and teens in communities of color are disproportionately impacted by community violence, particularly in racially segregated and high poverty neighborhoods. Systemic racism and bias and discrimination, economic instability, concentrated poverty and limited housing, as well as education and healthcare can drive these inequities and create more violence. People with multiple ACEs, including exposure to violence, are more likely to have short-term and chronic physical and mental health conditions and behavioral difficulties. And for those of you, ACEs is an adverse childhood experience. And we know that when kids have these, um, they are at, or when humans have these, we have a larger chance of negative health outcomes. And one of those ACEs would be commun experiencing community violence or witnessing community violence. Communities of color are often disproportionately experience these negative conditions, placing them at even higher risk for poor health outcomes. And while exposure to violence affects all SES groups, however, youth from lower SES backgrounds tend to have an increased exposure, creating higher chances of negative health outcomes. And none of this is jaw dropping. I don't know that anyone would be surprised to learn that different communities like this maybe experience more violence or have more um, negative experiences in their communities. It's vital to understand these concepts in order to adequately prevent and intervene in our prevent these experiences and intervene in our communities. We need to continue to learn about the intersection of these characteristics and experiences of violence to ensure that the intervention measures that we create are whole and effective. If we don't take time to understand how some of the most well-intentioned systems could still be negatively impacting individuals in our communities, then potentially placing them at higher risk, then we're not really treating the issue. Furthermore, if we aren't able to critically think about the youth in our communities, whether that's clients we serve or students we interact with or the kids that are in our homes, then we're missing key opportunities to help support them and protect them and grow them despite their adverse experiences. All of this kind of critical thinking and planning has been complicated further since the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the CDC reported a steady increase in mass violence in the country with data showing a 35% increase in gun homicides between 2019 and 2022, which takes a collective toll on all of our mental health. I think that I would say, and, and from a place of vulnerability, I can say there have been times where I have felt unsafe in a community where maybe 10 years ago I wouldn't have felt that or things like that. So it is something that we can all identify with. While acts of community violence can be seen can seem at first glance straightforward or like morally two-sided. The reality is that both the perpetration of that event, so the person or the event or the reason behind it happening and the experiences of being a victim or witnessing the, those events are multifaceted. There's, no, there's not a universal approach or a quick fix or an all-star answer that we can give today to kind of say, this is exactly what we need to do to reduce community violence, this and only this. Instead, it's kind of this larger, more multifaceted approach. And for that approach to be effective in preventing and reducing community violence, it's, it's absolutely vital that as individual community members, we must participate in everything from impacting policy and advocating for others and having the conversations at our dinner table at home. We also have to accept where our research is flawed and where maybe research studies were not designed to give us the information that we need as it as it applies to cultural competence. We know that a lot of historical research on this data was not designed from a kind of diversity, equity, inclusion standpoint. And while newer studies that are being developed are designed from that standpoint, it's important that we can kind of evaluate that when looking at some of this data, that we can understand like, hey, that might not be totally accurate, or we need to look more closely at this, or we should be asking some different questions in this area. Hey, Alex, we do have another question yeah. here in the Q&A. Um, 
Ms. Williams says that when kids or is asking, when kids see violence, what would you suggest parents do if they don't know the resources to help their child or if they don't have the money to get their child seen? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually have a whole slide later dedicated to specific activities that parents or consistent adults in child's lives can do. But to kind of give a brief answer, a lot of that is going to be building a relationship where you can talk about it and acknowledging that it's happening. So if if you are a parent who maybe doesn't have the resources to have a child seen or isn't connected to those things, you can be a support in that child's life by being open to discussing that experience with them. I think a lot of times we feel like maybe minimizing those experiences or not lending to the severity of them is protecting that youth. But when they experience the severity, it's important that we acknowledge that. And we're going to go over a plethora of other things that a caregiver can do to kind of mitigate that and to help support a kiddo. But that's kind of the first answer um, on that slide for now, if that's okay. And I'd add to that, it's okay for adults to express outrage, you know. Um, it kind of communicates to kids that you know, there are things that we feel are really unacceptable and that they shouldn't have to get used to living a certain way. I think that that can be really empowering. And um, we can even sort of model for young people ways that they can um, grab hold of self-advocacy and advocacy in their community in ways that can be transformative. Absolutely. So, Ultimately, when we're we're wrapping up the conversation around factors that complicate risk, so these different identifiers that maybe put some at increased risk, we can inform you that as practitioners and members of the community and parents, et cetera, that children of color and LGBTQIA plus youth and youth living in poverty or youth with mental illness or um, children experiencing multiple ACEs are at higher risk. But it's more important that we don't get comfortable with the idea that these populations are always going to need more support, are set up to be less successful, are maybe not always going to have all of their needs met. We have to shift the idea to it's not about just the cards they were dealt and how we respond to that. It's how do we change the cards that are in their hand? And so I think that it's important that we don't just say, hey, these populations experience this. So let's you know, make sure there's all these resources to respond to that. While the response is important because people are experiencing it, the prevention and, and getting down to the root idea of why are these disparities existing and how can we prevent the disparity from being there is is just as, if not more important when we're talking about preventing community violence. We have another poll here that I'm gonna launch that kind of is a commitment poll. So it's just us asking you um, what you what's something that you can do within your community um, in the next two weeks that would address this disproportionality or maybe help you understand it better or help others that you work with understand it better. So I'm gonna give everyone about a minute to answer this poll and then we'll go through some of the answers. And Dr. Abby, while they're answering those, I do think I'm going to go ahead and skip the video on the next slide just for sake of time. We have a lot of really good content in that I don't want us to not get to share. So just wanted to give you that heads up. Oh, man. Awesome. I love to see you guys responding. I know that can be a difficult question or one that requires a little bit more thinking. Give it about 15 more seconds and I'll go ahead and read some of those answers. If you didn't have the opportunity to respond though, like please take these commitments on as things that we can do um, even if you didn't get a chance to, to write it down. I think our commitment to being able to do something even if it's just small is really important. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and look at some of our answers here. Okay, so, so things that people could commit to, um, being more aware of that disproportionality, um, people may be saying that they weren't quite aware that it was that um, large or that two weeks can be a difficult time frame. Um, showing people where they can get resources or help, I think that that's a fantastic one. I think at times we get stuck where we know we have these resources in the community, but we miss that connection piece sometimes where we're connecting people with them. 
um, engaging with students and their families from a trauma lens at upcoming parent events that are happening. A lot of people were honest about just something that they need, it's something they need to think about more. And I really appreciate that. I know when we were writing these polls, I had to really think about that. I was like, okay, what's something small and actionable that I could do um, to really try to reach and affect that disproportionality in a positive way. Other ideas that we had here, um, Dr. Abby, if you want to comment on any, are, are going to community meetings or at like perfecting my own education, spending more time educating myself. Um, we have a member here who's part of an ally support network and it challenges them to be humble and authentic in their interactions. And so they can be a resource to their community. I think that's fantastic. Sharing information with coworkers who weren't able to attend today, address topics in DEI, address topic DEI coordinator. So looking at who are who are our resources within our own organizations that can help us put this at the forefront of priorities. There's some phenomenal commitments in here, guys. These are fantastic. Any that stood out to you, Dr. Abby? I can't see them. So oh, I'm sorry. I was, I was just relying on like what yeah. else. Absolutely, I forgot that you wouldn't be able to see them. I apologize. Okay, we're gonna skip over that video for now for sake of time. All right, um, we shared a quite a bit of information with you guys about the problem that violence presents for communities of children that we work with and also communities of children in our lives as well as the threat to public health when we have significant numbers of children and older youth growing up in environments where they don't feel safe. We wouldn't be here and we know that you guys wouldn't be here if we accepted these conditions as inevitable and non-changing. While we know there's no one fix onto this problem, we know that it is possible to dramatically shift the trajectory that it appears that we're on to one that's safer, more protective and supportive where all children can and do thrive. So we're gonna shift this discussion from what we know to what we can do about what we know. So the first thing is prevention, and this comes in a lot of different ways. And a quote from the Center for Disease Control says, the community violence takes lives and leaves a lasting legacy of trauma and that it must be prevented. This is a little bit of like an absolutely duh kind of, kind of quote for me because it is absolutely something that needs to be prevented and, and it, that trauma has such an impact on emotional well-being and brain development. So some of those things that we can do to prevent or respond to community violence is to strengthen the economic supports within the community. So making sure that we have the policies in place that we need to support the members of our community who maybe are lower SES or who maybe have some other barriers to having their economic needs met. If we know that being, being of a lower SES status could impact your experience of community violence, then we need to be addressing how we can pull people up kind of over that poverty line and really support them. We can also strengthen youth skills. And this is really broad and it can mean anything from their employment skills. So ensuring that our youth are able to get jobs that are going to teach them how to be a professional one day, how to engage in professional workplace. This can be things where maybe it's clubs or uh, other activities that they enjoy. Um, if, they're, if they're in clubs, they can learn leadership skills and things like that through schools or community centers. It also contributes to um, like sports skills or artistic skills, things that are going to build their self-confidence and kind of reaffirm their self-identity as someone who is positive. And that self-identity is really important to be strong when they're going to, when they come in contact with some of these more adverse experiences. We see restorative justice programs in schools and community centers being a fantastic way to prevent violence. Um, Dr. Abby spoke a little bit earlier about kind of the connection between how aggression feels like a need or is perpetuated in a teen's life and how exposure to it can kind of numb some of those things. These programs can help intervene and ensure that that cycle of violence is stopped or kind of the brakes are hit a little bit. So teens are able to kind of engage in a more positive version of some of that. Connecting with caring adults and activities, there is nothing more important than the relationships that our kids have with the consistent and caring adults in their lives. That will be something that you hear throughout the rest of this presentation as well as our presentation next week. It's really about that relationship building between adults and the caregivers they have and adults that, and 
or sorry, the children and the caregivers they have and the adults that are consistent in their lives. And then again, that connection to activities, to things that bring them joy, to things that they like. And then quality education early in life. We absolutely know that when we're focused on being, when we focus on education as early as possible, that's going to set a kid up for success. That's going to help their brain develop in positive ways. And then in addition to that, it's vital that we continue to conduct research. We don't have all of the research that we need to inform all of these prevention strategies in the way that we have decades and decades of research on other topics. This kind of um, impact that community violence is having right now is new. This is the largest impact we've probably felt of community violence, if not in a really long time, if not ever. And so we have to continue to prioritize studying these effects, studying what methods work so that when we go to spend money to implement things, to gather resources, we know what we're spending our time and energy on is impactful and actually benefiting the youth in our communities. That was a tremendous blueprint for prevention. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when we think about action and advocacy in the context of trauma, um, I think about movement. Movement is not just a metaphor in trauma. It's not just about putting one foot in front of the other metaphorically. It is literally about finding ways that you can get activated and advocate for self and for others. When the trauma-informed paradigm taught us to consider making the shift from what's wrong with you to what happened to you, we also learned that we that that helped us to learn that we're all essentially able to ask those important questions of each other. Meaning one doesn't need to be specially, like, specially trained or educated to engage in mindful, intentional, and supportive conversations. That's essentially the trauma-informed approach. Likewise, we learned that each one of us is capable of intervening in the life of a child or an adolescent in profound and meaningful ways. When adults come into that full awareness of this fact, communities can become more empowered to take action and advocate for the safety, security, and protection for all young people. Families in most cases are doing the critical work of providing for children's needs, their nurturing, their protection, love, and support. And then the community can then be an extension of that core network of support and connections. For some children who may struggle to have their needs met in their families, their community can be a saving grace and support their needs in ways that don't have to compromise their connections and their identity. Communities can create that physical and relational environment where opportunities for support, stability, love, and thriving are not only possible, but they're probable. But when communities are in peril or have been deeply impacted by violence, including young people with direct lived experience in the process of co-building plans to address community violence and invest in strategies and resources that promote well-being and prosperity are essential. Added to that, working collaboratively with community members and those directly or indirectly impacted by the violence in their community so that prevention and intervention can be community driven, culturally sensitive and developmentally appropriate, appropriate is also essential. I love Dr. Abby before you get into cultivating sanctuary. Okay. sanctuary sorry, I know I would like to switch the slide, but I wanted to comment on how it truly is everybody. And I think that sometimes we hear these statistics and we get really overwhelmed or, we're, or we as the professional understand what needs to be done, but we're working with caregivers to the point of our question earlier, who maybe don't have that same level of education or experience. And you really just give a lot of empowerment and reassurance to that anybody can be trauma-informed and anyone can have these conversations and support our youth in so many different ways. And I think that that's really kind of a bright light of hope and, and a topic that feels really scary. We've seen so many young people, you know, that haven't even finished high school yet, um, this impress us with their level of advocacy for their um, friends, their fellow students, their schools. Um, after major school shootings, they have found ways to get activated and get coordinated and strategic um, and take it all the way to Capitol Hill. So this is within all of us to be able to find ways 
to add, not subtract to that equation that builds like strong communities. Absolutely. We wanted to talk to you also about building or cultivating like what we just call sanctuary. We believe that sustainable communities build sustainable kids. Safety provides the core building blocks for a stable and protective environment where kids and their adults can thrive. It goes without saying that the first and most important response to community violence exposure is to work collaboratively with community members to reduce violence in the environments where children grow up in the first place. There are many examples of community-based strategies to reduce violence that have been effective, and we're going to share some of those with you before the close of this webinar. Um, we can also partner, though, with parents to find ways to limit or mitigate children's exposure to violence, even in neighborhoods where violence is more prevalent. By providing careful supervision and monitoring of their activities and by creating and investing in activities and events where their safety is actually a priority. Um, I don't want to sound like a broken record or an old lady here, but um, have you seen the game Grand Theft Auto? I mean, have you watched someone play Grand Theft Auto? It is a very popular video game. Um, and we've known for some time now about the well-established relationship between violent video games and the desensitization of aggressive behaviors. Uh, when it comes to violent video games, I sort of wish we could take the name game out of it. Um, I think the word game sort of automatically disarms parents from truly understanding the impact and potential for harm that exposure to this content presents for young developing minds. Researchers at, the effect, researchers at the effects of community violence on child development found given that violence exposure impacts children's stress reactivity, prevention and intervention programs that help children understand and manage stress are an important ingredient in promoting resilience and adjustment for children exposed to violence. There are many effective approaches to reducing violence that don't have to involve law enforcement. For example, investments in housing, healthcare, job programs, education, after school programs, gun control, environmental design even, and violence interruption programs have all been proven to quantifiably reduce violence. Community-based programs can provide trauma-informed resources and programming for children and older youth to keep them safe and manage their stress in their environments. All right, we wanna move you on a little bit to talking about resiliency in the context of the developing brain. The development of effective and efficient Prevention intervention requires a better understanding of the specific developmental processes that are disrupted as a result of child trauma, exposure, and how those disruptions can ultimately lead to short and long-term mental health problems for children. We all need healthy coping mechanisms, especially in hard times. Did you know that regardless of background, economic status, or family makeup, the developing brain needs these three things, okay? First, it needs exposure to a caring and consistent adult. It is uh, undeniably like the most important thing that developing children need. Number two, um, the developing brain needs exposure to enriching opportunities and activities. Stimulation. And number three, the developing need, brain needs freedom from what we'll call toxins. Those are not just alcohol and nicotine. Toxins can be stress. It can be trauma, adversity. Strong social support networks not only foster healing, but can also increase healthy behaviors long-term for children. Sometimes we have feelings and experiences that we can't talk through with our loved ones alone. So we need professional help and support. And so we need to normalize the conversation of reaching out to different professionals in the community. 
Healthy community may include becoming more involved with your communities and connecting to local resources and services. What is perhaps one of the worst consequences of community violence we talked about earlier is that inability to fully connect with parts of your community that we actually need to help us grow, um, feel more, uh, like strengthen our relationships and feel like we're more connected and we have our home base and that our identities can thrive. This fear can ultimately threaten how our communities thrive in the long run. So thank you, Dr. Abby. That's such a good introduction to resiliency and to how that brain develops. And now we're going to get into some of those more actionable things that we can do to really, really hone in on some of those skills. Um, so Kendall Taylor says that in the same way that the weight sitting on a scale or a teeter-totter affects the direction it tips, the factors that a child is exposed to affect the outcomes of their development. A child's scale is placed in the community and has spaces on either side where environmental factors get placed. These factors influence which direction the scale tips and ultimately the outcomes of that child's development. And so here you can see one side of the scale is going to have things like adversity and trauma and painful emotions and behaviors and kind of that kind of toxic experiences to the point of toxins that you just made, Dr. Abby, or fear experiences. And on the other side, we have resilience. And so we're going to talk about these four skills of resilience um, in a little bit more depth here. So we have four areas of resilient skills. So we want to build our executive functioning skills. We want to build our emotional regulation skills, our body regulation skills, and then our interpersonal skills or like interpersonal safety skills. And so that's more than just like physical boundaries, it goes a little deeper into what um, is in align with, alignment with our values, what makes us feel like we have psychological safety, et cetera. So we can talk about body regulation first. I'm going to go a little out of order here. And so body regulation is a set of skills used to achieve balance within the physical body. And we know that throughout childhood, these body regulation skills are typically built through different nurturing interactions and our bodies are constantly seeking that balance. So if we experience stress for too long or um, maybe don't have enough stress, we can see some of that balance go back and forth. To Dr. Abby's point, there is some healthy stress out there, studying for a test, preparing for a presentation like this, et cetera. And so we want to see that healthy stress cook paired with those nurturing kind of reaffirming experiences. But if that doesn't stay balanced, we can feel those effects physically at times. And so some of the skills that we teach kids at Camber when it comes to body regulation that we teach in sessions that we teach parents to do with kids at home is things like yoga or progressive muscle relaxation or deep breathing, mindfulness, meditation, um, exercising, getting moving, kind of getting that like physical release out there to kind of ensure that we're able to regulate our body. I think that if, if someone asks you like when you're, when you feel overwhelmed or scared or angry or frustrated, and the answer might be different for those different emotions, but what does your body feel like? For me, I sometimes like, like if I'm really, really overwhelmed, I'll lose my hearing. Like I, I know things are happening around me, but I can't, for a few seconds, I can't hear that or my hands start to sweat our heart starts to race. So we want to be able to identify when we're starting to feel like that or teach kids how to identify when they're starting to feel like that. And then utilize these skills to bring their body back to balance, to calm their body down. Another skill we're going to talk about is that executive functioning skill. And so executive functioning skills are developed skills that, that are utilized to complete tasks, to manage distractions and to control impulses when we're focusing on like activities and goals. Strong executive functioning skills improve development throughout childhood and promote success in school and reduce the likelihood that they're going to engage in risky behavior. Um, and to kind of give an analogy for how our executive functioning works is the Center for Developing for the Developing Child at Harvard kind of uses this metaphor. They see it as an air traffic control system. So um, you have kind of this busy airport where things are coming and going and airplanes are taking off and landing. And so for a kid, there's so much input into their brain and things that they're trying to put out of their brain. And the executive functioning skill is the ability to manage all of that in a way that doesn't result in plane crashes. 
And typically these skills are built over time through progressively challenging experiences. And that's kind of like, think of, if you think of scaffolding on the outside of a building. So we're talking about how you have to build one skill before you can build a second skill. And so these skills build upon each other. But what we see is that when kids have um, adverse childhood experiences, including exposure and witnessing community violence, whether that's through like a secondary resource like the news or social media, or because they're, they're standing there physically witnessing it, or because they're a victim of it themselves, some of those scaffolding areas are interrupted. And so then we struggle to build some of those skills. So things that we want to focus on with kids are working memory, um, cognitive flexibility, and inhibition. And those all seem like really big things in my mind. But when you look at the different activities that help achieve those, we're talking about like, a, like helping kids learn to like direct their attention at something or um, maybe challenging a child to multitask when they struggle with that or helping them make decisions or cr like processing through critical thinking patterns, um, having them strategize how they might tackle a future problem or a hypothetical problem, um, helping them get organized and helping them learn to stay organized and organize their thoughts. So these are things that we typically do in all of our different work settings, whether that you work in a school or community center or a hospital or, or wherever you guys are, these are small things that we're doing on a day in and day out basis. And these are those tiny interventions that are helping these kiddos build those skills. Another skill that's important for resilience building is emotional regulation. And so when we talk about emotional regulation, we're talking about how we can respond to the feelings that we're having, how we have control over how we respond to those feelings. And so um, these are gonna be things like being able to identify what we're feeling. So first of all, spending time noticing what we feel like when we're having certain emotions and finding the right word, teaching kids the right word to identify what they're, what they're feeling. Trigger identification is a big part of this. So working with kids to tell, be able to say like, that's not gonna be something that I handle well, or I maybe need to limit my exposure to that. We do this all the time at our in our programs at Camber is what, like if a kid's like, I don't know what my trigger is, we have conversations around, well, let's kind of, let's go through that experience moment by moment and talk about, well, did your palms start sweating? Like what were some of those physical reactions? Well, what were you thinking about doing, even if you didn't do it when you were having this experience and, and through those kind of moment by moment assessments, we're able to hopefully dissect like, Hey, that's, that's what really got to you. So how can we prepare for that? And then also prevent exposure to that and the best of our ability. Another emotional regulation skill that we're going to want to build is, is coping resources, knowing what helps me calm down knowing what helps me feel regulated and being able to do that in any space. So that might look different if you're sitting in a classroom versus if you're at home and the family's arguing. And so working with kids to have kind of this large toolbox of tools for emotional regulation and for coping so that they always have a resource they can go to. If kids only have one coping mechanism, then sometimes we get pigeonholed into well, my coping mechanism is listening to music. Okay, well, you can't listen to music always when you're sitting in class or when you're doing this activity. And so we want to make sure that that toolbox is, is really full and is full of all the things that we may need. And then that last resilience building skill is interpersonal skills and, and safe resources and interpersonal safety. And I think it's important to note that interpersonal safety is a right for all people and no one deserves to be like abused or neglected or a victim of community violence or witnessing community violence. And so we are kind of our own best advocate. And so this process really helps kids have conversations about and define what safety means to them. What makes them feel unsafe? How can they avoid things that make them feel unsafe? Um, what boundaries do I need to set with the people that are in my life? Where can I access support if I am feeling maybe like one of those boundaries was violated or a trigger is coming up? And so the culmination of these skills is going to help our youth and our community be able to kind of bounce back or cope with the negative experiences of community violence that they're having. And you know what, the picture of the little boy there in the center of the screen, you know, we just wanted to share is not, you know, stage clip art. That is actually a picture from a yoga class in the school from a school in Baltimore that was experiencing significant school decline um, engagement um, 
performance declines and emit a lot of school violence. And they introduced um, yoga to um, the children and saw a almost like almost immediate but drastic reduction in all of the negative stuff they had been measuring and had been kind of um, burdened with for actually years. Uh, it was so successful that the parents started to peek their faces into these classes and they had to actually eventually set up a parenting yoga class. Parents had become so interested and curious about how their children um, had become so behaviorally regulated, not just at school, but at home. Wow. I love the story behind that photo and, and the impact that, I mean, this, that these skills are having in real time. And so, it doesn't cost a lot. No, absolutely not. And and so that's those are the skills that we're trying to build. And as professionals, we can come up with, I'm sure, a million ways to build those skills. And we just talked about a lot of ways and, and prioritizing them, but it can, it can feel different as a caregiver or a consistent adult. And so these are just some ways that caregivers, adults in children's lives, um, I love that now a lot of schools are referred like who's your adult um, can do. And, and that's create a warm and non-judgmental connection. And so we're talking about making space to talk for children to talk candidly about what's on their mind, working with them to learn to name their emotions and that they're not afraid to tell you how they're feeling or tell an adult how they're feeling and that we're acknowledging what's being experienced and, and we can acknowledge adults how it how it affects us. Um, helping practice for coping and emotion regulation. So that's gonna be encouraging the problem solving. Explain how we as the consistent adult or caregiver in their life solve our problems. They don't need to know maybe all the details of all the problems, their adult problems, but we can help kind of show them the steps of I think about this first or I think about this and walk them through that. We can do self soothing activities together. So maybe that's doing yoga together, going for a walk. Maybe the family does some deep breathing at the end of the night. There are things like that that may seem really small in the moment, but are going to help our kiddos. We can encourage healthy thinking patterns um, with acknowledging uncertainty and kind of exercising control where we can. So, hey, focus on what's in your control and how you respond to things and kind of coaching kids through some of that. We can also remind kids that it's okay to feel scared or to cry sometimes or that we also have those experiences. And then we want to make meaning together and we want to kind of create a space of hope. So connect to our family, like connect to the family values or the values between the adults and child, connect to community resources, get out in the community, have friends, go to events, feel joy. We want to cultivate that joy. And then we want to model healthy coping habits. So we want to show them like, Hey, when we're struggling, these are the things as the consistent caring adults in your life that we do. And all of this can be done through the mindfulness of like a developmental stage or age. So with smaller children, it's going to be more like maybe you're snuggling them more, you're holding them close. You're looking for maybe regressions and behaviors if they're struggling. And then our older children, it's going to be more of that verbal processing and that problem solving. And then we have proactive approaches to keep ourselves as caregivers and um, providers safe. And I think Dr. Abby made a commitment a long time ago that we should never do a presentation that didn't talk about self-care. And I love that. And so I know we only have a few minutes here, but these are just some things that are really important for caregivers and consistent adults to prioritize their sleep and their own relationships outside of their relationship with the child they care for, to find time to have some time alone to get fresh air, um, to prioritize our own health. So engaging in preventative health measures, seeing our PCPs, doing, go, getting our teeth clean, doing those things that put our health first so that we're not having to respond to health issues later, hopefully. Um, knowing to access the resources that we have. So I might know about resources, but am I accessing them? Am I utilizing them? That's what they're there for. Um, engage in your own hobbies. So role model that you have things that you like to do, one for your kid and two, do it because it brings you joy outside of, child, uh, outside of caring for a child in your life. Um, and set boundaries and be realistic. It doesn't all have to be perfect all the time. I think that like big humans and tiny humans, we're all humans and we're all experiencing this world together. And we just need to be realistic about the idea that as a caregiver, we might not have it all figured out, but that transparency is going to help build that warm, non-judgmental relationship with our kiddos or with the kids that we care for. I'm glad Alex just went over some of that list because I know we're running out of time, but as teachers, therapists, nurses, support staff, and other allied professionals, we are especially vulnerable to stress and trauma as a result of our close contact and engagement with children and teens.
violence and other, and other issues. Secondary trauma is a risk we incur when we engage empathically with those who are suffering. It can be described as the behaviors and the emotions resulting from helping a traumatized or suffering person. And these behaviors or emotions may manifest in emotional fatigue, hypervigilance, numbing out, disengagement with your job or organization, and depletion of your physical, emotional, and cognitive resources, and sometimes your financial resources. There are specific strategies that Alex just shared with us that we could really use to be proactive about our, our own resilience. But mostly, I just would like to say that we can normalize communicating about the impact of what it feels like to support people who've experienced trauma, at least with each other, whether it's through formal or informal channels. This can go a long way in fostering healthy and supportive professional environments. Absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead and toggle to our last slide here, which is just some different resources and where you can access supports for kids that you're working with or maybe families you're working with. Um, I know that our time is up here in just about a minute, but I'm happy to hang on for a couple minutes if anyone has questions. But if you need to hop off, I know our, our training is ending here. So this is our last slide. So um, and Dr. Abby and I will stick around for a few minutes. And Sarah, let us know if any more questions come through the chat we need to address while people um, exit our training. Our yeah, plant there's... story, though. Our plant story. Oh, yes, we do have a plant story. Well, let's see if there's any questions first, and then we'll okay. get into that. The, the only thing I was going to say is uh, Rochelle Dupree said that this is wonderful. Please look at raisingkc.org. It's a public health initiative around creating safe, nurturing, and loving environments in our area. We are looking for people to collaborate, oh, to create a hub for parents, families to get education, support, and resources from one place. And the official launch is in March of 2024. That's amazing. I will add that to this resource, to like one of these slides before we send the PDF so everyone has access to, to has information to access that. All right. I think you can move to your plant story. You still have, um, yeah. Go for it, Dr. Abby, if you want to take us away. <laughs> okay. So this is my plant. I think it's called a ZZ or something, right? Yes. I'll Okay, anybody, does, if you know Alex, you know Alex is a plant guru, and I put this plant in a much bigger pot because she is just growing, and I said, Alex, what's happening with my plant? It's not growing anymore. It's very sad, and I showed her, and she said, oh, that's because it's a ZZ. They like to be in very tight environments. Put it back in the small pot. That's not what they need to grow and thrive. They need to be hugged real tight. And right, am I explaining it yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, I read it as like they'll break the pot. Like you'll know they're yeah. they'll be ready to be repotted when the pot breaks from the compact of the roots. <laughs> I thought it was a gorgeous metaphor for like what communities need and what we need sometimes. Sometimes we can think it's just like bigger and more, but sometimes what we really need is like a tighter hold and hug um, to help us thrive. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that was such a good ending to this topic. For those of you that are still with us, thank you. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your Wednesday afternoon. And hopefully you will join us next week to kind of take a deeper dive into school violence.